Welcome back to Seeking the Truth About the Sword of Truth. My name is Tom, and I will be your guide as we spend this episode exploring Chapter 13 of Wizard's First Rule. In our last episode, Richard, Chase, Zed, and Caitlin begin their journey to the Midlands, leaving the Bradstone household, headed to a path through the Boundary. Please note these episodes contain spoilers, heavy spoilers, not for this, just this chapter, but for future chapters and books in the series. If you haven't read the series yet and you intend to, I'd encourage you to read the books first and then come back to see what I think about them. Spoiler alert, the more I look at these characters, the more I'm able to see myself. At the beginning of this chapter, best estimates place the time since the beginning of Wizard's First Rule on the evening of the fifth day. We begin the chapter with Richard sitting by himself on a rock, thinking about the problem he is having. And while he leans against that cold, chilled rock, uh, he is met with a faint, blowing, icy wind. We quickly learn all of them agree standing watch in shifts throughout the night is wise. We also learn Chase has placed himself in charge of who gets what shift and when those changes will occur. The act of standing watch is one that has a long history. One such example in American history is the story of Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. A accumulation of facts surrounding this event collected in Wikipedia has been researched by me and determined credible enough, also by me, uh, to allow the following information to describe it. In mid-April of 1775, American reconnaissance of British Army activity indicated impending aggression against the Massachusetts Provincial Con Congress. Paul Revere and William Dawes prepared an alert, initiated when Robert Newman, Newman used a signal lantern to alert colonists in Charleston of the Army's advance through the Charles River. Uh, Revere and Dawes rode to met, meet John Hancock and Samuel Adams in Lexington, alerting as many as 40 other riders along the way. Revere and Dawes then headed towards Concord with Samuel Prescott. The three were captured by British troops in Lincoln. Prescott and Dawes escaped, but Revere uh, was returned to Lexington and freed after questioning. By giving the colonists advance warning to the British Army's actions, the ride played a crucial role in the colonists' victory in subsequent battles. The act of keeping watch is a desire to have a more complete knowledge of previously unseen threats, which may cause irreparable, irreparable harm if allowed to get too close to what the Watchers are trying to protect. In the Sword of Truth series, we see the practice of keeping watch occur frequently. Symbolically, it goes back to the symbolism represented by the two surprise Gar attacks. By failing to observe the interactions which occur within our own minds, we become blind to things which can harm our ability to observe the world as it is and think clearly. When those things are upon us and we're under attack, in the moment of instinct often is a powerful force of the rational mind to engage with, especially since sometimes the decisions we make to act on that instinct is the best choice for the situation. But instinct is not enough to prevent harm. It is only a sensation from the senses to warn us we have arrived at a moment of decision. We still need to figure out what that decision is. The conscious and rational mind is still in control of what it decides to do with the information. Since thoughts are slower than instinct and feeling, the more time a person has to assess their given situation, the more information they will be able to gather and explore before a response is needed. When the threat remains the same, the added time to strategize and gather resources can be the difference between meeting a threat strategically from a position of authority and advantage and being set upon suddenly with little or no chance to defend oneself. While setting the watch order, Chase decides Richard will take the first watch, followed by Zed, with him covering the third and final shift. Caitlin objects to Chase, deciding she, she doesn't get a watch. At first, this may appear to be a decision rooted in misogyny, and the author is not shy about introducing characters who possess this biased character trait. Chase, however, is not one of those characters. Chase places value on independence and effectiveness. And throughout the Sword of Truth series, we repeatedly ch see Chase do everything he can to give Rachel an education in the various ways of self-reliance. He gives her a knife, he teaches her how to use it, and as she ages throughout the series, her abilities grow and become critical uh, to several key points within the story. Chase is far more practical than a simple dismissal by gender. If he were to make the argument uh, in favor of Chasen's actions, the most logical conclusion I reach is one rooted in observation and analysis of information. And Chase is given all the information he needs to make this deliberation when Zed, Richard, and Kaylin get him up to speed at his home the night before. Chase and Zed both have been enjoying lives of relative stability for some time. Both times we encounter Chase are during the course of his normal duties. Eh, duties. Whenever sleep and eating habits he has have been relatively stable. Zed has not missed a single night of sleep, and aside from a midnight stack at the Bradstone estate, he hasn't missed any meals either. Richard has been through more than Zed and Chase in the most recent days, and has gone through everything Kaylin has with one key difference. 
Richard was not tired and hungry when they first met, and even though he was injured, he was able to sleep for a day and a half to get his strength back. Kaylin has been through everything Richard has in the past few days with the same opportunities for rest that Richard got. However, before she met Richard, she spent the last few weeks traveling at a breakneck pace to Westland, traveled through the boundary without sleep uh, uh, with, or food, much more than her body would have preferred, and she was not taking care of herself or might more likely did not have the opportunity to take care of herself properly. While some decisions within the Sword of Truth series are justified with assumptions of gender, I don't see this as being one of those decisions, nor do I see Chase as thinking of the mother confessor of the Midlands as weak or unable to physically endure the act of standing watch. They have enough people who are better rested to allow her to catch up to the level of stamina the rest of the group already possesses, for no other reason than the rest of the group has not gone through everything she has. Kaylin's protest is perfectly in line with her symbolic representation of justice. She sees an immediate imbalance and must act to make it right. However, her attempt to do so in this way is also a symbolic representation of her inability to look at her justice objectively. She does this with Zed when she asserts the needs of the many are enough to justify her destruction of the honorable old wizard if he chooses not to help, which in his instance would end up destroying part of what ends up being necessary to save the world time and time again. Zed turns out to be crucial at many different key moments. While her intention is good, she cannot see that a blanket application of justice in every situation or feelings of injustice alone would actually result in a worse situation than the justice one was trying to prevent. If she uses her power on Zed for reasons she feels are right, life goes on for a while, but eventually the world ends. If she uses her power of persuasion to insist she gets a watch, same as everyone else, she is causing herself to miss recovering the stamina she will need in the upcoming days and weeks ahead, especially since she is playing catch-up in that regard to everyone else. However, to be fair to Kaylin, she doesn't put up much of a fight and likely wanted to make it known she was willing to pitch in in the same way everyone else was, more than she actually wanted to stay awake when she was likely still not fully recovered from her extended and stressful travels. Richard stares out into the scenic landscape and notices what a pleasant-looking place this is considering how close it is to the boundary. He also feels bad for the destruction of the woods uh, created by Dark and Raw putting the boxes of Orden in play. He imagines a forest in its natural and undisturbed state, wondering how beautiful it was before it was destroyed. Much like the symbolism from the last chapter, the erosion of the land surrounding the boundary represents the encroaching danger of the rational mind. As the trees die, the mind inside is made smaller and more and more of it becomes choked off and dead, no longer capable of sorting life. This is not to be confused with the coming down of the, the, coming down of the boundary, which we will get into in a future video. Dark and Raw's destruction of the boundary represents something else altogether. The boundary itself is the limit of reason, and anything that crosses too far crosses over into madness, and is lost in a sea of decisions made uncontrollably at the whim of whichever higher power uh, denies them the freedom to exercise their free will in any way. It no longer even considers giving rational thought to what lies beyond uh, the mandate of that highest authority, regardless of what information uh, and reality the senses provide. Chase tells Richard it is unlikely the Heart Hounds will reach this far, but Richard isn't taking any chances. He holds the Sword of Truth in his hand for reassurance and scans the countryside, vigilant and watchful for any threat. Within the landscape of the mind, this is an interesting interaction between Chase, the symbol from self-reliance, and Richard, the symbol for integrity. Independence is much better equipped to stand against the irrational restrictions placed upon it when reality is ignored to preserve the good feelings associated with the certainty provided by a comforting higher power. Integrity, on the other hand, is a more densely packed and protective internal mechanic. Integrity strives to maintain consistency within itself. Independence is what goes out and fights against the loss of free will by force, overpowering it, destroying that which falsely claims there is no point to thinking about something we cannot choose to act any differently uh, about, because there's no point. We have no control over it, and we feel we have no control over it, so that's where the discussion ends. That is not how independence works. Independence attacks that directly. Integrity is our sense of self and how strongly we hold to that sense of self. It is the night watchman which constantly seeks to find what thoughts or ideas would attempt to shake us from what we know to be true based on rational observation and thoughtful analysis. The gars, heart hounds, and the boundary itself, along with the monsters it contains, are all representations of things which attempt to subvert our free will. Integrity is the essence of free will. For integrity to protect the mind, the mind needs to be willing to step back from itself and observe from a neutral position. 
It is not enough to have faith in the self because that faith is only a feeling. And feelings are only good enough until a stronger one comes along and overpowers it. Integrity combined with the truth of what is rather than the truth of what we wish is the only way to protect ourselves from this. The only way to have integrity is to root everything in the most basic facts a person can find. And the two most basic facts are, I will have feelings based on what I observe. And I have the ability to decide what those feelings are correct or incorrect. Those are two separate things. Integrity can be subverted and weakened if it does not remain vigilant against the threats which may damage it. This is reinforced when the author describes Richard as wondering what yet unknown threats he is not aware of are hiding behind that darkness inside the boundary. Instead of catching up on some much needed rest, as Chase suggested, with the assignment of the Night's Watch, Caitlin stays up late to have an important conversation with Richard about what happened earlier. For a time, she only sits next to him, cold and close to warmth, unintentionally jabbing Richard in the side with her knife handle, which he ignores because he doesn't want her to move away. If I'm using the same standard to analyze this interaction I use for everything else, we're able to see Richard protecting himself from outward threats and doing a fairly good job of it too. Uh, however, his budding love for Kaylin makes him recognize something which hurts him, but also convinces him to ignore that pain in favor of holding on to something which makes him feel good. Not all such instances of cognitive destruction are fatal or even noticeable, but they still exist and are able to be identified by the subconscious. And in this instance, by warding himself against the big and obvious things, Richard got stuck in the side by someone he cares about, albeit unintentionally. Richard makes conversation by asking Kaylin if everyone else is asleep, wondering how she can know for sure if Zed is sleeping because he sleeps with his eyes open. Kaylin tells him all wizards do this, not just Zed. The symbolism here is my favorite kind of symbolism. The kind of symbolism that hits you over the head with a hammer because of how obviously symbolic it is. Wizards in the Sword of Truth series represent the ability to see beyond cognitive interactions that are obvious. Uh, they view the very real but often unseen reasons people make the choices we do. Sleeping with your eyes open is a symbolic representation of being aware while others are blind. In short, Zed is quick-witted, aware, and fast, even while he's fast asleep. Caitlin tells Richard that she came to tell him, uh, came to him in the night to apologize for telling him she wouldn't have wanted to come after her. And then she drops the F-bomb on him. Caitlin tells Richard she appreciates his f -f 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 friendship twice. And she says what they are doing is more important than one person, even if that person is herself. Richard senses that she isn't giving it to him straight, so he asks her to explain a bit more, specifically the do you have a boyfriend or husband waiting for you back at home part of it. Caitlin lies to Richard and herself when she tells him he asked a question which does not have a simple yes or no answer. Richard picks up on this immediately and says, yes, it is. Either she does or she doesn't. Richard is correct here when she says the answer to the question is a simple one from a position of fact. Caitlin misinterprets the complicated reasons behind this simple fact as proof that this fact doesn't exist. Her status is single. She knows it. However, she has tied this answer to reasons behind why she is single and for the moment needs to be convinced to separate the two. She is single, and it's for complicated reasons, tied to her obligations. Linking one to the other contains the logical fallacy of correlation without causation. She is single, and it's complicated. Kaylin's honesty makes it difficult for her to tell Richard she does not have similar feelings about him, but Kaylin's slightly skewed sense of justice has led her to believe her feelings, her feelings are not as important as her ability to help others. And when a good choice must be made, it is her who must go without, just like her decision to object about not having a shift on the night's watch. Richard picks up on this and spends the next few minutes covering all the things he knows about her in his mind. He observes and praises her intelligence, wit, and courage, all the qualities she possesses in tremendous amounts. Richard repeats the lie he told himself in the last chapter over his exclusive ownership and participation in the special smile she gave only to him, which, spoiler alert, does evolve over time into something more accurate. In an article titled, This is what happens to your body when you fall in love, Helen E. Fisher, a biological, biological anthropologist, at Rutgers University wrote, romantic love is an addiction. It's a very powerful, wonderful addiction when things are going well. When a person starts following in, falling in love, their brain releases chemicals like vasopressin, adrenaline, dopamine, and oxytocin, which activate the neural receptors, creating euphoria and a sense of purpose. Many of the same chemicals are released through the injection of heroin. Well, physically or emotionally separated from the new love, or a substance you're suffering an addiction to, the body releases cortisolacorbin, a stress response causing anxiety and depression. Serena Goldstein, a neuropathic doctor in New York City, asserts 
this moment is when the addiction to newfound love comes into play. Since you're not having the addiction satisfied, your body will be in a state of turmoil until it gets what it needs. And right now, Richard has it bad. The author winks at the reader when he writes, Richard would slay a dragon to make her smile at him, clearly in reference to Scarlet later in the novel. Richard shows good judgment when he doesn't interpret her body language as the last thing and the, after the last things she said when they were just friends as an invitation for the old, let me just la yawn and put my arms around you gag. Caitlin tells Richard Chase warned her the next two days were going to be difficult, and it might be a good idea for her to get some sleep instead of taking a shift with Richard during the night's watch. Richard realizes she is trying to decide what she is and isn't okay sharing with him, and he isn't a part of that conversation. Only she has ownership of her consent. Richard reminds her of her obligation to him and says she, he expects her to keep her promise. And Kaylin let Richard know that she feels badly about the whole not being able to express any affection towards him by expressing affection towards him when she kisses her fingers and puts it on his cheek. Richard thinks about this for a long time as he suffers from withdrawal and unrequited love. Having been left alone by Kaylin, with only the stars to watch him, Richard decides to pull out his sword and start polishing it because he has nothing better to do. I'm serious. That's almost verbatim the words of the text. Go check it out for yourself if you don't believe me. Richard substitutes adrenaline for oxytocin when he imagines all the things which would threaten her. The sword feeds off Richard's intent and fills him with anger. Richard is surprised by how quickly the anger is able to seep in. Richard asks the single most important question the symbolic representation of integrity can ask itself. What is the sword perceiving in him? Richard, unsure of what the answer is, puts the sword away and his anger with it. The author chooses a very specific word to describe Richard's reaction to the anger. Seductive. Richard realizes his anger is dictating his actions right now, and the anger feels good to think about. There is no reason the truth can't be used to justify feelings of anger. Some of those reasons might even be right, but he realizes something is wrong when he notice, notices he has the order of operations mixed up. He's supposed to look at the situation and then decide how that makes him feel. He almost justifies his position and decision to put Caitlin first, regardless of how important his mission is. While he doesn't say so out loud, Richard accepts he's being irrational and replaces the sword's comforting, misplaced, and counterproductive anger with the gloom and solitude of inconsolable heartbreak. The author's choice of the word inconsolable is significant and illustrates to the reader just how important Richard's integrity is to him. He is alone in the wilderness with no one to observe the choices he makes. He is feeling inconsolable. He has the choice to take the anger of the sword and use it to replace that feeling with a stronger one, which feels much better. However, he chooses the pain which is rooted in reality over the good feelings rooted in fallacy. Through his actions, Richard shows everyone he cares more about his own integrity than he cares about avoiding the unpleasant emotional consequences of following it. Also, take a moment to notice that while Richard is using the anger of the sword to mask his pain, there are no references of him keeping watch for approaching threats. Not one. He fantasizes about wanting to have something to fight and about all the different things that uh, he is going to stop which are coming after Kalen. Immediately contained within the same sentence, which describes the anger being put away, is a description of Richard resuming his scan of the countryside. While Richard felt better by being angry, his anger blinded him to his surroundings. With about an hour left in his watch, Richard hears familiar footsteps approaching. Zed approaches in simple robes, carrying enough cheese for two people. Richard asks, what's this all about then? And Zed says he wanted to keep him company because he's been having a rough couple of days with the whole end of the world and almost being killed so many times. Not to mention the pretty girl on the horse who says she won't be his girlfriend. Zed tries his best to make Richard feel better by offering him some cheese. Richard isn't hungry for cheese, but he does accept Zed's offer of friendly company. Zed does the most important thing another person can do when communicating with another human being. He attempts to understand where the person is coming from, which is very different from understanding what the other person is saying. The true value of empathy isn't found by agreeing with someone or by a memorization and comprehension of the words that are coming out of the other person's mouth. That's only part of it. Empathy is worthless until the person trying to use it learns what feelings exist behind the words being expressed. The same statement with the same words can have two wildly different meanings to two different people. Zed shows his desire to understand Richard by asking him to explain what is the matter. 
and he doesn't stop until Richard gets to the heart of the matter. He tells Zed he is convinced Kaylin likes him back, but doesn't understand why she's keeping him at arm's length. In this scene, Zed is using some very, very, very high-level cognitive physics on Richard. Take a moment to consider what Zed knows as first wizard. He's well-versed in prophecy. Once he knows Richard will be the seeker of truth and finds out Kaylin is the last confessor alive, making it here, making it here in this moment, the last mother confessor, he has enough information necessary to place Richard within key prophecies, including ones pertaining to him and the last mother confessor. We also learn later that Zed knows how a confessor's power works, and the only way a person could be with a confessor is to love them so unconditionally that there's no opportunity for her magic to take hold of his rational mind. Zed is also witnessing Richard and Kaylin's attraction to one, each other, one another and recognizes the significance of this. Zed cannot interact with this dynamic directly to the, due to the conservation of cognitive dissonance because due to the nature of the magic and the way our own minds work, the very act of mentioning the solution would create a small enough amount of equal and opposite reaction within Richard's mind uh, that it would no longer be possible for him to have no doubt. Maybe not a lot of doubt, but enough to cause Richard's mind to be destroyed. Zed is not telling Richard the truth when he tells Richard he can't be with Kaylin, and he knows he isn't telling him the truth when he keeps telling Richard it's impossible. He does this because doing the right thing and getting the right outcome is more important to him than having people understand and agree with the words he is using to achieve that effect. The only thing Zed can do is feed into Richard's cognitive dissonance surrounding the paradox. Richard knows Kaylin likes him, and he feels like there must be a way to get around whatever's keeping them apart if he can just figure out the right answer and piece it together. This piece of knowledge is covered under the loose definition of the uh, unwritten wizard's rule. Knowledge cannot be given, only earned. If Richard doesn't figure it out on his own, no one can do that for him. While Zed can't give Richard the answer, he can make the part of Richard which feels like there must be an answer stronger by disagreeing with it, which he does at every turn, while simultaneously tell him, telling him things he can latch onto to give him hope that the endeavor is worthwhile and could produce the outcome he is looking for. Zed weaves a beautiful tapestry of seamless cognitive manipulation on Richard to help him find the answers he needs. Since this tapestry is so well woven, the different strategies of cognitive influence are mixed in and melded with each other. I'll list a few of his quotes out of order to more easily identify which quotes are using which cognitive mechanic. The first principle Zed uses is the conservation of cognitive dissonance in its simplest form. Richard gives him information. Zed says he is wrong. When Zed says Richard is wrong, it creates dissonance because Richard thinks he is right, and he knows he's right. The conservation of dissonance occurs when Richard interacts with Zed's idea and is met with equal and opposite force. Richard's opinion is actually strengthened by these collisions. This interaction is one of the more well-known cognitive interactions and is a type of reverse psychology. Reverse psychology is a fancy term for understanding the relationship between emotion and cognitive dissonance and realizing sometimes the words chosen can have the opposite effect where different words would lead a person to conclude of their own free will, that they are being reasonable by agreeing. Zed says, She is other things and has responsibilities. She is afraid of losing your friendship. She is not the one for you. She can't be that. You just have to trust me. She cannot be what you want. Find another girl. Pick another. That doesn't change the facts, Richard! Exclamation point. It will not work out between the two of you. I wish it were so. There is no way for it to work. I wish it were so, but it is just not. Just be her friend. You can be nothing more. All of these are examples of Zed's reverse psychology campaign. He also takes some time to reinforce and validate the reasons Richard feels like Kaylin is the right person for him when he says, She's a good girl. We all like her. She cares about you more than she should. She's a wonderful person. Zed admits that if a trusted person told him to ignore his feelings about his wife, he would not have listened. Since Richard already believes these things through... Uh, the conservation of cognitive dissonance works in the other direction by taking advantage of something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when the mind finds information it already agrees with and uses the presence of that information to strengthen their own belief in something. Zed tells Richard things he knows he believes uh, to strengthen his belief in those things. 
The entire deal where Richard asks him one question and swears said to honesty to prove his point is a con game run by the first wizard himself. He sets himself up as the fall guy so Richard can use that victory to feel even more sure about his position than he was before. Try reading this section again without Zed to distract you and watch how Richard's thoughts are guided by Zed's interaction. Here are some of the high points in Richard's feedback to him. Everyone knows her secrets but me, and she w shouldn't worry about losing my friendship. It won't happen. I'll agree with you if you answer my question, right? If someone asked you to pick someone other than your wife, would you? I thought as much. You said it yourself. I'm the seeker. There's a way. I will find it. At the end of the conversation, Richard is more resolute and focused than he was before asking Zed to explain to him why he was wrong. Either Zed is a really, really, really bad person when it comes to giving useful advice to his friends that they will listen to, or as he is a very, very good person at using the right words to give his friends exactly what they need, even if they aren't sure what is right for them in the moment while they're trying to figure it out themselves. After he's finished having advanced psychological tactics used on him by his grandfather, Richard asks Zed uh, why he really came out here to talk to him. Richard says, Boy, Zed, what's all this about then? And Zed says, Can't an old man come and sit with his grandson without an ulterior motive? And Richard says, Zed, I have ironclad evidence which proves you have an ulterior motive for coming here. And Zed says, Richard, you aren't going to believe this, but I have an ulterior motive for coming here. Zed tells Richard, The seeker of truth almost made a big mistake. Richard says, Zed, you aren't going to believe this, but I almost made a big mistake today by going after Chase. And Zed says, Richard, I can't believe this. You know it was a bad decision. You almost did it anyways. Richard accepts accepts Zed's counsel regarding one bad decision. But Zed isn't finished because he needs to warn Richard that as the seeker of truth, there will be innocent people along the way who are suffering. Zed tells Richard it's vitally important to remember the laws of cause and effect. There will be cries for help, which he will have the power to answer. However, by answering those cries for help, he will lose focus on the larger issue at stake and be vulnerable to that which can destroy him. And Dark and Raw will have no problem using the suffering of innocent people to manipulate him into destroying himself. Zed is warning Richard about violating the wizard's second rule. Kindness and good intentions can be an insidious path to destruction. Sometimes doing what seems right is wrong and can cause harm. The only counter is knowledge, wisdom, forethought, and understanding of the first rule. Even then, it's not always enough. The single most fundamental right a human being has is their free will. And the wizard's 13th rule says as much when it says, we cannot change the nature of humanity by force, violence, or imprisonment. We've already established that cognitive dissonance is responsible for creating things which attempt to supersede and subvert free will. The freedom of choice is replaced by a higher power which determines the course of action regardless of the outcome. The pain of others is frequently used as a justification for slavery. The claim that a human being only has free will uh, so long as there isn't another human being nearby who needs something from them. Uh, the more powerful the need, the more powerful the sense of obligation, and the less consent the person being petitioned over has choices. Zed is talking about the weaponization of good intentions. He is saying that humans, from a desire to do good, can be led to act in self-destructive ways. The reasons are always different, but the call to action is the same every time. The call, the lie, the pull, the pleading, the yelling, shouting, screaming, the heartbreak, the anger, the violence, the death, destruction, and mayhem are all the result of a single fatal cognitive interaction. A thousand different lies with a thousand different faces, all saying the same thing. They are saying one individual doesn't need to consent willingly if another person says they do not. But you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, you shouldn't. I'm just a guy with some cameras and a microphone and a little bit of spare time to make these videos. I am not the thing which matters. I have no authority except the absolute authority I have over the choices I make and the reasons I deem fit used to make those choices, the same as every other human alive. I choose my free will and willingly consent to improve my life and the lives of those around me. But I make no mistake about it. Those choices are mine to make, and no one can force me to choose any differently for any reason. I can be manipulated. I can be fooled. I can be threatened. I can be degraded and humiliated. I can be pressured and coerced. I can be falsely labeled. I can have my heart, mind, and soul misrepresented and twisted by those who have never met me, but claim to have intimate knowledge of what is in my heart. And by all of those things, they want to take my consent 
to their ideas from me. They want to force me to agree. Those are just my words. If you care about the sanctity of your own consent, like the symbolism within these novels claims that you should, then listen to the words. Your life is yours alone. Rise up and live it. Think about it for a moment. Look at the methods certain groups and organizations use to maintain power and gain followers. Go to those sources of information that make you angry, the sources of information you know are wrong, and look at them. Find the moment where consent is forcibly required while a list of terrible physical, emotional, and existential consequences are waiting to be unleashed against you at a moment's notice just for disagreeing. Make a game of it. Find one of these places online and type two words, I disagree, and see how long it takes for people to find you with facts, figures, claims of emotional callousness or intellectual blindness. See how long it takes for someone to try and force their decision onto you. (coughs) See how long it takes for someone to care enough about you as a human being to ask you why you feel that way. How long it takes them to ask what important thing Uh, what important thing you care about is behind your decision. These people aren't thinkers, they're followers. And as Zed says further down in his speech to Richard, that is the life many people are destined to live uh, as followers. And as much as I enjoy making these videos and running my Facebook group, I would trade a thousand followers for one rational, free-thinking individual who will not budge when asked where the buck stops regarding the decisions they make and who is responsible for the consequences of those decisions. If the answer to those two questions is unequivocally, I am, then you are a thinker. Agreeing to this changes nothing else. Those still have access to all the facts, figures, data, and information, and counsel they had before. The only thing that changes, the only thing that changes, is the thing which changes everything. It is the decision to recognize the ownership, responsibility, and consequences of the free will in their possession. Zed tells Richard this in a thousand different ways and uses the wizard's 10th and 12th rules. Willingly turning aside from the truth is treason to oneself. And you are free to destroy those who speak the truth, but you cannot destroy the truth itself. To act as though as as you have no free will is to destroy the one speaking the truth. The only difference is in this situation, the one being destroyed is the mind which is telling the person they do not get to choose for themselves. Zed's warning to Richard is the most serious one he has given to him so far. By surrendering the ability to consent to the cries of the innocent who need help, who are in legitimate pain, but claim their only salvation is the sacrifice of your free will, because you will do for them which they cannot or will not do for themselves is a path to slavery, and will leave a person drawn in by their good intentions and seer desire to help in no better of a situation than the person who told them to help in the first place. Their good intentions will ruin them because they will no longer have the power over their actions to decide what will make a situation better. Because the only other choice is they say they're powerless to change their own life and they need a part of your life to make it work. And everybody gets their life and their life only. You don't get anybody else's. Not rightfully. Zed says, They think no plant should be allowed to grow taller than the shortest. And he goes on to say people would cast another into the fire to burn rather than light a candle themselves. He goes on to say there is never a shortage of people who passionately and personally believe they are good and just and will fight for whatever lies make them feel like they are doing good. The Mai Lai Massacre, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Nanking Massacre, the Rwandan Genocide, the Armenian Genocide, the Cambodian Genocide, the Nigerian Civil War, the New Kratian Whole Dormor, the Holocaust, were responsible for the deaths of millions of people. Every life ended, every meal withheld, every switch pulled, every bomb dropped, every fight ever fought had one thing in common. The person who consented to end a life thought they were right to do it. That is not to say life never needs to be protected and violence or force is not the only answer which makes sense. Fighting is a thing which produces pain and suffering. The same thing as cognitive pain and suffering we experience when we use cognitive violence on each other. The trap is to look at a terrible thing and forget 
the thing which makes it terrible is the person who uses their consent to use these tools to destroy and, and enslave. Using those same tools as the last resort of a person, given the ultimatum to die or surrender their consent to live their own life, uh, is a salvation. The decision and responsibility to know when life is being destroyed and when life is being saved falls to the individual who is prepared to release violence. The only way for a person to make sure they are on the right side of things is for them to ask themselves, is violence being used to force consent or to protect it? Richard tells Zed he's having a hard time figuring out why people would ever agree to follow someone who's doing terrible things. Zed's answer is simple. When a person is willing to surrender their free will with the higher power of that which makes them feel good must be good, they believe any lie told to them uh, claiming that they are the voice of good. They are told lies which makes them feel good, powerful, important, right, and just, and believe them with all their heart because that is what a good person wants to be. But the lie they tell themselves is that one person is capable of giving that status to another. The only person who can make a person good, powerful, important, right, and just is the person who examines their words and actions against the level of respect they have for the consent of others. Not a consent to blindly follow that which claims to satisfy their wishes, wishes but a firm and staunch rejection of anything that claims ownership of this can be taken by force. Richard feels restricted by his desire to protect the innocent, and he is. Dark and Raw has more tools at his disposal uh, which are capable of using force without consent to destroy others, either physically or by using his knowledge of the wizard's rules to lead them astray. Zed says the, if the opponent is stronger, you have to be smarter if you want to win. Richard makes an error of correlation without causation when he says, I've really got my balls in a vice here because I can't dar kill Dark and Rawl. Not being able to use the sword of truth to kill Dark and Rawl is not an inability to kill Dark and Rawl. Zed says, Richard, I know you feel like you've got your balls in a vice, but not being able to use the sword to kill Dark and Rawl is not an inability to kill Dark and Rawl. Richard accepts Zed's chain of logic and asks him if he ever had to let innocent people die. Zed tells him he has in the past during the Great War against Panis Rawl, and right now while Dark and Rawl kills people to try and find out who he is. He says he does have the power to surrender himself and stop people from being killed. Uh, and that would, but that would prevent him from using his unique knowledge and talents to stop him from killing an even greater number of people. Zed is describing another instance of the trolley dilemma. Philosophynow.org released an article titled, Could There Be a Solution to the Trolley Problem? This article refer references American philosopher Judith J. Thompson, who wrote a paper called Killing, Letting, Die, and the Trolley Problem. George is on a footbridge over the trolley tracks. He knows trolleys and sees one approaching this bridge that is out of control. On the track ahead are five people working. The banks are steep and they will not be able to get off the track in time. Zed knows the, uh, George knows the only way to stop the trolley is to drop a very heavy weight in its pack. The only available sufficiently heavy weight is a fat man, watching the trolley from the footbridge next to George. George can shove the fat man onto the track of the trolley, killing him and preventing the death of five. Or he can refrain from doing so, which results in the death of five men. Zed says regardless of his feelings about the situation, if he's going to act like he cares about protecting life, then he must do so from a position which acts like he's caring about protecting life. Zed is the type of character who is willing to push the fat man if it means a greater prevention of loss of life. From his position, either life is important or it is not. And if he prioritizes needing to feel like he did the right thing over doing what he feels is the right thing, the five men who die as a result of his choice won't be any less dead. He is still in full possession of his ability to decide to do nothing. This is where the conservation of cognitive dissonance takes over for many people. The desire to be right is a powerful one, and the desire to be right is deeply rooted in the higher power that most killing is wrong that many people share. However, this position does not go any further to analyze the reasons behind it. The reason, is, the reason killing is wrong is because it's wrong to end the life of another human being, and I will be the first person to admit the preservation of life is a noble pursuit. If the preservation of life is the highest calling, in this specific instance, there are several facts which are rooted in observable reality. There are five men whose lives are about to be ended by the trolley. There is an option to kill an innocent man who prevents the death of five more. These are both facts which are independent of anything else. They are as true today as they will be in a hundred years. If the preservation of life is the primary goal, then regardless of which outcome, some loss of life is impossible uh, to prevent. The decision is no longer, can all life be preserved, which is the argument many try to make. 
The question is now, how much life will be preserved? By that standard, five lives are greater, uh, a greater preservation of life than one. However, if the decision isn't based on the preservation of life, but rather the decision of who can take a life, when and for what reason, then it is better to let five men die whose deaths are the responsibility of the trolley rather than be directly responsible for the death of one. Arguments ensue as to which is the better position, but for Zed it's a simple choice, just not an easy one. He pushes the fat man from the bridge and saves the lives of those who would die. But that's not the end of the story because Zed does nothing to dismiss the fact that he is responsible by the responsible by the laws of cause and effect for the murder of an innocent man. Another version of this problem would be a group of people who are in a survival situation. Within that group, there are two diabetics and only enough insulin for one of them to survive. If no one is given the insulin, they both die. If one of them is given the insulin, the other dies. One of these people is a 40-year-old trained doctor and the other is a 75-year-old seller of propane and propane accessories. Due to a conflict of interest, both have agreed to place the decision into the hands of an impartial third party. If you were that third party, who gets the insulin and why? Let me know in the comments below. Zed says it's a painful choice to let a few die horribly, or to let even more die horribly. Never once does he ever attempt to circumvent uh, the cause and effect relationships tying those deaths to him. Those are his burden to carry, and he makes no attempts to deny what his reason tells him to be true. Richard tells Zed that Kalen has chosen to let others die in an attempt to save lives for everyone else. Uh, for Kalen to make it through the boundary, Shar's life was forfeit. Zed offers knowing sympathy and tells Richard, while we all hurt for different reasons, the hurt is the same. Richard tells Zed he tried to offer one of the apples in his backpack to Kalen, and Zed laughs because red fruit in the Midlands is poison, and he was essentially giving her a death threat. Richard tells his grandfather, Zed, you aren't going to believe this, but Kalen made a mistake by letting me live when she suspected I was trying to poison her. Zed tells his grandson, Richard, you aren't going to believe this, but Kalen's secret powers, which uh, only she is allowed to tell you about, meant she was in full control of the situation and can afford to give you a chance to explain yourself. Zed puts Richard in a difficult spot by asking him if everything was on the line, and he suspected but didn't know Zed might be a traitor to their cause, a threat to all life, if he would be able to use lethal force against him. And this makes it less cut and dry than the simple trolley experiment. Richard isn't allowed to know for sure but only that he believes it to be legitimately possible. At this point in his character development, Richard isn't sure, and Zed tells him it's a good thing he isn't in that situation right now because it could mean the death of everyone everyone else. He, his point is Richard has no business being the seeker of truth if he's going to depend on other people to make the tough calls for him. Richard tries to cop out of the situation by arguing against the initial conditions. He said Zed would never do anything to betray him or his cod, and Zed tells him, he isn't playing by the rules of what if, and he's missing the point of the exercise. The point is, in essence, the true meaning behind the wizard's eighth rule. Deserve victory. If Richard is going to put himself in the position he is in, he has no business at all being in that position if he can't make that decision. Poop or get off the pot, Richard, but no one can pinch that turd off for you. And even if it hurts, even if it strains, even if it makes you feel like you're giving birth and getting lightheaded and you're going to pass out, the way is the way, and what is, is. Richard can't help himself and looks to Zed for some strength. He asks if Zed would be able to do this to, to him if the situation were reversed, and Zed, Zed tells him, absent pride or joy, he would do so in an instant. Richard accepts all of this and tells Zed he is resolute but scared. Richard turns the topic of conversation to deadly fruit problem in the Midlands, and he asks why red fruit is poison. Zed tells him Panis Rall got his hands on some magic that he was able to use to turn red fruit poisonous. The reason he chose red fruit was because he knows children would be poisoned by it. Zed describes the poison as slow acting and difficult to trace, causing fevers and eventually death. Zed says a lot of people died, just not children. The symbolism here is not pleasant, but it is obvious. The red fruit is symbolic of the calculated and systemic weaponizations of cognitive dis dissonance, which seek to convince a human being to give up their agency of consent. They are false flag operations, correlations without causation, self-destructive mandates wrapped in the guise of compassion, and a thousand other methods all designed to accomplish the same thing. Reduce a human being to a call to action, where their only value is whether they do or do not consent to the thing requested of them. And the people behind this aren't above destroying the mind of a child before they're strong enough to defend themselves against it. In November of 2017, a journal, the journal Pediatrics released a study titled Children, Adolescents, and Screens, 
what we know and what we need to learn. They wrote, a child's ability to understand persuasive content is shaped by their cognitive development. And children, even older ones, struggle to understand and respond to persuasive messaging. They go on to say, there is good evidence showing that children do not understand messages at the same level adults do. Specifically, younger children are more likely to believe the message they see as purely informative. Zed says that the red fruit is poison for everyone, not just children. And I don't think anyone needs to look too far to see many of these messages released for public consumption are taken on faith and given credibility, which is never earned. Look at the current attitudes regarding the weaponization of cognitive dissonance as it relates to science. After my time in colleges, I was awarded a bachelor's degree in physics. As I was working full-time during my education, it took me five years to complete this program. There was not one semester during my time there which did not include at least one class within the scientific field. Based on that information, it is not unreasonable to assume I am familiar with the scientific method. And nowhere in my incredibly overpriced college textbooks is the phrase, believe in science, anywhere to be found. A true scientist, or even less than that, a true rational thinker, would never require faith to be tied to a scientific endeavor. Some argue a person should put their trust in the experts and listen to what they say because they know the material better than they do, which is true. That's a fact. But those scientists are better informed to pursue scientific knowledge, but they are not immune to the condition of being human. And as a result, they are susceptible to all of the same fallacies of consent and biases the rest of us are. From a very specific point of view, it seems reasonable to assume that scientists would use their science to seek the truth, and many of them do. However, in the world of science, money is a requirement, and there aren't very many scientists who are wealthy enough to fund their own research, and that money often comes with certain expectations. Much like a congressman is expected to play ball when a company... Uh, with a company to ensure their lucrative position after their service to their country. Similar expectations are tied to the money going to the scientific community. Discover Magazine released an article uh, titled Science's Worst Enemy, Corporate Funding, which cited an investigation by the San Jose Mercury News uh, found stating one third of Stanford University's medical school administrators and department heads had reported financial conflicts of interest related to their own research. These uh, included stock options, consulting fees, and patents. The New England Journal of Medicine reported Avandia uh, released, uh, reported the drug Avandia raised the risk of heart attacks in patients by 43%. Two days later, the FDA, which had already been assessing the health risks of Avandia, imposed the toughest warning label, the black box, on the drug. Uh, a subsequent uh, congressional hearing revealed the FDA had known about Avandia's risks for some time. Rosemary Johan Liang, a former FDA drug safety supervisor, had rec recommended a black box warning label for Avandia due to its harmful effects on the heart one year prior to the research containing this information being public. According to Johan Liang, my recommending a heart failure warning box was not well received by my superiors, and I was told I would not be overseeing the project. She was also obtained to obtain her supervisor's approval before making any future black box recommendations. Press reports over the last 15 years have shown scientifically educated, credible whistleblowers doing research within the FDA who have attempted to expose drug research and safety issues uh, being pressured. Some of those were threatened with legal actions. Others were punished by their superiors and discredited. Uh, Neeson, a scientific researcher, said, Whenever we raised safety questions about drugs, there's always been a reaction like this, often by people with explicit financial ties to the drug industry. If you're curious who is spending uh, the most money on privately funded scientific research, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. The same companies who pay congressmen lots of money after they leave office for their wisdom and experience are the same companies who pay scientists to use their wisdom and experience to do these studies in the first place. Pharmaceuticals, the insurance industry, big medicine, the food industry, and yes, environmental studies all operate under the same dynamic. And my point isn't that all science is bad. A lot of these guys are trying their best. My point is, if you want to do more than have faith, you are being told the truth. The cost of that decision is to require more proof than a study which is paid for by a private corporation which stands to profit on the outcome, which is then fed to our congressmen who are influenced by the same companies which funded the study to draft favorable legislation around it, which are then in turn promoted by the media outlets and uh, 
publications, which are funded by the same companies who funded the study in the first place. The word of another is no substitute for an inquisitive mind. And more often than not, when I have been of a mind to go digging into a suspiciously one-sided scientific claim, it never took very long to find out how that message was being monetized. Science does not require faith. Religion does. And there is nothing inherently wrong with religion either. Religion is founded on belief, and many of those beliefs are a great comfort and help to those who have them. But science isn't a religion. If you need to believe in it, that's probably because parts of it which aren't useful to the people who have bought and paid for it have been thrown out or hidden deeply within the margins and footnotes of their data. And as shown above, the very act of looking for and releasing that proof is met with very serious financial consequences and career ramifications. And if you don't believe that that is something a person would do, ask yourself if you worked within a company and you were the sole provider for your family and you had to choose between mentioning something in an email that didn't affect you one way or the other and all you had to do was look the other way and you would keep your job and your status or you had to pick between doing the right thing with the full knowledge that you would never work in your chosen field again because people with more money than God would be coming after you to make sure you never saw the light of day in your career again. Ask yourself what decision a human being would make and if they would put their health and the safety of their family above uh, the desire to raise their hand. And many people in the scientific community uh, are in that position and they have to make that call where many times we do not. And Oftentimes, they are given money to feel better about the choice they make. But don't take my word for it. Uh, science uh, doesn't require faith. Some things do, but science isn't one of them. The people promoting the science are asking you for that, and there is money in their pockets with expectations tied to it. Uh, think for yourself, over the last five years, uh, can you recall messaging which was produced uh, targeted towards children? Or can you think of a prominent child who was used as a spokesperson and this type of promotion, uh, this emotional promotion, will continue to work so long as feeling right is treated the same as being right. Zed tells a story about someone he liked and trusted being spotted with magic uh, that they had no business messing with. He says he thought something was wrong and wanted to say something, but by the time he found out, by the time he decided to say something, he found out it was too late. His failure to follow the advice he gave Richard came with a terrible price. One life was spared in the moment, and likely thousands of children lost their lives as a result. Richard asks why Westland wasn't affected uh, by this magic, and Zed tells him it's because all magic has limits. The, symbol the symbolism here is the mind can only be forced to ignore so much, before uh, so much contradiction before dissonance makes that impossible to rationalize. As the boundary symbolizes the rational mind separated from an inability to think beyond what feels good or bad, there is a limit to how far the damage can spread within the mind. Richard asks if it's possible to reverse the spell, and Zed says if they can survive this whole crazy dark and raw thing, he'll give it his best shot. Richard has a lot of problems, and he remembers that solutions are the solution to most problems. He asks Zed to do something about the cloud that is following him. Zed says Richard is right, but he doesn't know how the cloud is attached to him, so he needs to figure something else out. Zed asks about the weather, and Richard can't remember there being any rain near him since his father's murder, or even any clouds nearby. Zed reasons that Darkenral has put a spell on the cloud following him, which pushes the other clouds away so he can find it easily. Richard, having never learned to study or heard about magic in his entire life, tells Zed he could put a stronger spell on the cloud to draw the other clouds to it instead of repel them. And if Darkenral isn't paying attention when he tries to push the clouds away, the stronger spell will break the hook on the cloud attached to him. Zed is incredulous, shocked, surprised even, and expresses this with a single swear before telling Richard he has the right idea and would make an excellent wizard. Richard says he already has one impossible job, causing Zed to frown. His dreams of having his beloved grandson follow along in the family business of knowing about magic and making fresh apple juice every day. While Zed is happy to see him, that really is a wizard rock in his pocket, and he whips it out in front of his grandson and lets it drop to the ground with a small thud. After spinning his fingers around it several times, it grows and expands, finally stopping once it is many times its original size. Richard is surprised because he recognizes it, and much like a grandson speaking to his grandfather over an alphabet pop-up book, Richard describes what is in front of him. Richard says, that's your cloud rock. And much like a grandfather spending time teaching his grandson what the pictures in the pop-up pop book mean, Zed corrects him and gives him the proper term, Wizard's Rock, instead. Zed uses some magic to get the rock ready, producing lights, colors, and the smell of a fresh, fresh spring rain. 
Zed tells Richard, step right up, my boy, and experience the genuine, bona fide, electrified, grand unification with nature wizard's experience. Richard steps right up and does all the women in the audience, and some of the men, not that there's anything wrong with that, a giant favor by imagining himself laying naked in the hot summer sun with his rippling six-pack abdominal muscles and chiseled jaw. Richard copies the same form he has seen from Zed over and over growing up. He describes feeling like he is floating on water, but really he is floating on light. Richard feels a rush of exhilaration, his mind clear and connected to everything around him. Still naked, with all the nature circling around him, he understands the tall grass, the bugs, the birds, the animals, the water, and the air. He understands how they're all connected to each other. Even though all outward appearances make them appear to be separate things, he understands how the different parts of nature seem to always be strategically placed so that, that, that no matter where the camera is, there's always a tree, a bird, or complete, conveniently placed rock to keep his good and plenties left to the reader's imagination. Richard describes himself as inconsequential yet empowered. He sees the world through the eyes of every living creature, seeing the world through their eyes instead of his own, gaining knowledge, insight, and empathy. He understands their joy, their fear, their desire, which all exist and melt into nothingness. He feels like the only living thing in the universe. He opens his mind to others who have lived before him, opening his eyes to the wisdom of untold thousands of years. And all of it is so beautiful, it brings tears to his eyes, tears which stream down his face, hitting his still imaginary shirtless body, rolling down his ripped six-pack abs before they roll off camera, which has tastefully stopped just before anything truly provocative is put on full display. I have talked extensively about the hardships associated with engaging directly with the mentally destructive parts of, of cognitive dissonance. When we follow the sensations of dissonance, the need to fight back, the need to verbally defend ourselves against any and every perceived slight, we limit our rational mind to our side of those interactions. That was the meaning behind Richard using the sword's anger to cover his grief. He felt better, but only because his world was so small he wasn't able to see what was right in front of him. Zed's cloud rock, his wizard's rock, and Richard's place on it have a profound symbolism, and it is the application of that symbolism which is directly responsible for the existence of this show. The author is describing what happens to a person when they're able to look at the world as it is through the eyes of others. The most natural thing in the world is for us to see the world through our own eyes and follow the advice given to us by our senses and reactions to cognitive dissonance. If a person is able to step outside themselves to seek to understand the views and opinions, pain and motivation of others along with their natural instincts and how they respond to challenge and empathy, they are given access to a whole new world of information and insight. When a person who is in pain lashes out and the observation goes beyond their actions, seeking to understand where they are coming from and why they choose to express themselves so forcefully, uh, it becomes much easier to see where their pain is coming from. And if it's coming from a place of self-inflicted and self-destructive habits or the unfulfilled desire to just connect with others in yourself, in others, in all things, seek first to understand, then decide how you feel about it. When one always comes before the other, that is when the power of observation is locked. And it doesn't take a genius or a philosopher or a cognitive scientist to get it. In fact, many of those very same people are just as blind as everyone else. Remember what Zed said about the seeker. They don't have to be the smartest person. They have to be the right person. And the right person is one who steps outside their own thoughts and feelings with an ever-present desire to always understand who they are talking to and where they're coming from before making any decisions or judgments at all. Personally, it took me 37 years to reach this point. And it was one of the most powerful things I have ever experienced. The author must have experienced this himself as well, because his words that he used to describe Richard's feelings could not be closer to how I felt when this happened to me. The ability to see what has always been right there in front, but always outside my direct field of vision, was the single most empowering feeling in all of my human existence. However, the sensation isn't one of awakening or transfiguration. It's the opposite of that. It's the sensation of removing a heavy weight that has been limiting and restricting for so long that most of us forget it is even there or what it does to us. It is years or decades of pent-up, unresolved cognitive dissonance being resolved and released 
The empowerment comes not from the addition of power, but rather the realization of how much power we already have inside ourselves. And the joy comes when a person finally figures out how easy it is to let go of feelings of pain, which have been holding them back their entire lives. Pain we fight ferociously to hang on to because we are familiar with it. And when it flares up and it is soothed, we are comforted by its diminishment. That small feeling of relief when the pain goes from bad to less bad is enough to convince us that that is the best we can do. And anything that challenges the source of that pain, even if it's to ask us to get rid of it, is a frightening thing and is met with the fury of resistance, which is equally as powerful as the pain we feel from experiencing it at all. The idea of letting it go is terrifying because what buys beyond is to embrace that we are responsible for every moment of our lives for good or for bad. <coughs> that does not change the fact that when a person choices suck and their life isn't what they want it to be and a never-ending list of things that is instantly generated to explain why any change, improvement, control, or influence is ultimately futile. In the end, those people die the same as everyone else. They die wishing for someone to rescue them from their lack of ownership of free will. It's only the ones who are willing to say to do something about that. We can do something about that. I can do something about that for myself. Crossing that threshold is the price of admission. Taking ownership of our choices and their outcomes. Where the buck stops with us, that is the cost. For some, it is a cost they will never choose to pay because thinking about it hurts too much. The very idea causes anger and contradiction. Uh, it's every instance in their life where a person has had bad choices, uh, which weren't entirely fair, had to live under the laws of cause and effect. Uh, but Richard shows us in Faith of the Fallen, when your choices suck, you use the ones you have to make small improvements over time until eventually you build up enough to stand on. Well, others like Nikki, who don't agree, are left asking how you get all the luck when other people need it more. They are blind to the cause and effect relationship uh, between choice and outcome. Richard sees this and sees the world through the eyes of others. And this is a moment he truly understands uh, how big, beautiful, and malleable the world is. The possibilities are endless. And the price of admission is admitting there is more than every decision we make, which is not rooted in the constant cognitive consent which states we are beings of free will and despite how easy it is for one to feel that way that feeling is ultimately a choice which needs to be made the only time it feels like there is no choice is when a person commits the fallacy of consent and uses their free will to behave as though they have none Zed throws some magic dust in the air which circles around Richard concentrating around his chest before it travels up to the connection between Richard and the cloud tethered to him well, we haven't heard Richard reference the tooth in a while. This language does seem to track with the bone Richard carries, usually being on a necklace around his neck. The dust reaches the cloud, sparkling inside it and drawing lightning from across the entire horizon in a profound and shameless display of nature's primal force. The lightning which spans to the horizon is symbolic of the full unleashed potential, potential which was always present yet dormant. Suddenly the lightning stops, the lights fade, and a fully clothed Richard is left standing in the quiet night air with only his grandfather to share the experience with. That is already smiling because he knows exactly what Richard is going through uh, in this moment and says, and Richard says, that was incredible. I never felt anything like that in my entire life. Zed tells Richard he has the talent for it, uh, if not the training. And even though he shows great potential, there is still the matter of his clothing getting in the way of the experience. Richard asks if the clothing makes such a big difference, and Zed tells him it makes all the difference, and learning how to do this without clothing makes the experience even better. This is the author's way of describing that, well, this journey is an incredible and empowering feeling. It is not the end of the journey. It's only the beginning of one. And while we can free ourselves from the major life-destroying effects of cognitive dissonance and unlock the awesome potential of our rational minds, powered by the awesome force that is our potential as human beings, that is not the end of it. The clothing represents that which we keep closely, that which we forget is there, but is literally touching us at all times, preconceived notions about fallacies of consent which limit our potential in ways we were never even thought we were limited. India Today released an article about Mahatma Gandhi describing the habits and attitudes he had about food. Once he said, experience has taught me it is wrong to have dwelt upon the relish of food. One should not eat in order to please the palate, but to keep the body going. To put it in layman's terms, feeling hungry does not mean anything except that a person uh, it does, doesn't mean anything except what a person chooses for it to mean. 
His position was, regardless of how powerfully the body was telling him he needed to eat, the choice to decide what those feelings meant and what he was going to do with them was always his to make. As a man of science who takes nothing on faith without researching it first, I decided to put this claim to the test. I've already practiced setting my uh, initial emotional reactions aside and withholding judgment, voice, or opinion until I have enough information to decide how I should feel about something. But I wasn't convinced such a thing was applicable to something so deeply primal as appetite. I have fasted before for different reasons, but in the past, all of those experiments were rooted in a battle of wills. The assumption being I could use force of will to overpower the force of hunger. I was relying on a stronger feeling to overcome the feelings of hunger. During my extended periods of dietary modification where certain foods were being restricted, willpower was enough to resist the foods I wanted to eat for a time. But my own conservation of cognitive dissonance would slowly build upon itself, building over time, craving validation and being strengthened each time I would deny it. Uh, until eventually, weeks or even months later, uh, the strength of willpower would wane. I would have a bad day or I would get sick or stressed out. And I was feeling, uh, the feeling I was using to keep that hunger at bay was too weak to stop it anymore. But in every such experiment, I had never approached the problem from a position of tranquility rather than of confrontation. The experiment was simple. The goal was not to eat anything for 48 hours. My own knowledge of the human body said there are certain things uh, normally ingested by food which are necessary for health and function, namely sodium and other electrolytes, as well as the necessary vitamins and minerals the body needs to function properly. And none of those things were difficult to acquire through a simple ingestion of lemon tea and electrolyte-infused water, which incidentally I found out after researching, after my experiment while researching this episode, is a very similar to what Gandhi himself used during his fast to maintain his body's health while enduring extended periods of not eating. There was only one thought behind my experiments. What would happen if I decided not to eat, but accepted that I was going to be hungry, and the only thing that gives my hunger meaning is the choice to act upon it? So rather than a denial of my body's message, which results in a buildup of cognitive dissonance, there was no denial of the feelings, only a denial that I had, that I was powerless to decide what those feelings meant. After about eight hours, I was feeling hungry, which I embraced. Uh, and while embracing those feelings, uh, I also embraced that I had the power to choose to give them uh, whatever meaning I wish. Uh, so the choice to not eat, even though I was hungry, was an easy one. After 18 hours, there were stronger physical changes. My stomach was rumbling loudly and roiling with its emptiness. Uh, if I were fighting my feelings of hunger, then those sensations would have been added to the weight of the argument behind my body's growing hunger. But because I had not engaged this feeling from a position of confrontation, those singles, signals had no authority. They simply were, and I accepted them for what they were. By the 36-hour mark, I was starting to get worried because the experiment was only designed to run for 48 hours, and I had not yet received the powerful call to action I was expecting. I expected my body to reach a point where the feeling of hunger would rise up and attempt to take control of my actions. And while there were thoughts of food and many opportunities within the house to eat a variety of beloved foods, the thoughts were only thoughts and were quickly dismissed by accepting the feelings as true without accepting I needed to do anything to act upon them. At the 38-hour mark, I decided my experiment was not difficult enough and took a moment to arrange a plate of fresh fruit uh, and delicious snacks of candy, packaged chocolates, and mixed nuts, which I kept near me within my sight at all times. I saw the food and knew I could eat it. The only difference between failing to not eat what I wanted and succeeding was my perception that willpower was required to do such a thing. Willpower had nothing to do with it and actually is a fruitless method of long-term behavior modification. It was not until I discovered I had the power to have feelings, but choose to decide what I was going to do with those feelings, that I was finally in harmony with myself and was fully in control of my actions. I should note that my wife prepared a delicious and nutritious breakfast the following morning, morning which I chose to eat with great joy, but not before staring at it a few moments longer than necessary, just to make a point to myself that even now I was choosing to eat because I was choosing to eat instead of choosing to eat by responding to a forceful argument from within myself saying that I must. This produced the unexpected result of making those eggs and bacon one of the best tasting breakfasts I ever had. That is just one example of a close and hidden assumption which guides our decisions and actions throughout everyday life. While it is possible to step away, it is not easy to remove the metaphorical clothing uh, and requires introspection and honest self-analysis, which builds upon itself over time, becoming easier to find and fix with every successful attempt. 
Richard says he feels better and more clear-headed, less depressed and stressed out. The world is still the same world, as is his place in it, but his ability to see what is there and what he can see is connecting to one of the things which is different, which gave him the confidence to see he was once confused and hopeless, but now things were beginning to make more sense because he was able to step back and take the emotions that were clouding his judgment away and begin looking for legitimate solutions rooted in reality. Richard thanks Zed, who tells him to hit the road and get some sleep, uh, before offering him the job as a wizard again, uh, saying he would be proud to welcome him into the Brotherhood. Zed follows up his sales pitch of giving Richard access to nigh unlimited clarity of mind and interconnectivity of thought between all things living and dead by demonstrating to him you can also use wizard powers to summon nearby cheese. It's time for the official number one quote from Seeking the Truth About the Sword of Truth in Wizard's First Rule, Chapter 13. Please note that the views and opinions of what the official number one quote for this chapter is may differ from the views and opinions expressed by you about what your number one favorite quote for this chapter is. In the event that your number one favorite quote is different from the one mentioned here, please list your candidate for number one quote in the comments below. And the official number one quote is when Zed says, Bags, you would think by now I would have learned not to let a seeker ask me a question. In the next episode, Chase puts Richard in front of the boundary to see what that's all about then. Kalen hits him a bunch of times for doing it, and then some things from the boundary give all of them a hard time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you feel like you've gotten something of value from this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you really like it, I ask that you share a link to this video with those you think might enjoy it as well. If those feelings are not there yet, I invite you to come back to the next episode and give me a chance to try and change your mind. Thank you for watching. My name is Tom. That is my cat in the background. And I have been your guide. This has been Seeking the Truth About the Sword of Truth. I hope you'll join me next time. And until then, live well so you can become seekers of those truths as well while I am seeking them. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. That one. That one. You guys at your toy? That one. That one I'm recording. My cat's name is Fat One. That one. Thank you, Fat One. Can you, can you drop it? Can, fat One, can you drop it, please? Fat One. He doesn't listen. That one? She's very insistent. That one. Thank you. Okay, she's good. See you next time.